Hi, I'm Mike Malio, and I'm an origin hunter. In today's mini webinar, I'm going to be talking about TMRCA. And no, it doesn't mean too many really corny acronyms. It means time to most recent common ancestor. TMRCA answers the question, okay, you and I are related by DNA, but how far back in time do we have to go to find that connection? Now, if you take any two organisms, two mushrooms, two rabbits, two humans, if you know the difference between the DNA and you know the mutation rate for those differences, then you can calculate just how far back a common ancestor existed. There's a a few basic DNA tests. If we look at the Y-DNA 12 marker test, it has a mutation rate of about 0.0019. The mitochondrial DNA uh, hypervariable region 1 has a mutation rate of about 0 0.00003. That means that Y-DNA has about a 60 times more likely probability to mutate compared to mitochondrial DNA. That says that mitochondrial DNA is fairly stable. Y DNA is less stable. But I'll talk about why that's good and bad. When you run a common ancestor calculation for a Y-DNA 12 marker test, you get a range of 16 to 80 generations. Now that bracket is based on a probability of 50 to 95%. So it's 50% probability that it's not less than 16 generations, and it's a 95% probability that it's not more than 80. But if you have just one mismatch in the 12 marker test, it jumps to 40 to 120 generations. And because not all Y DNA markers are created equal, if your DYS 426 has a mismatch, the probability shoots to 240 to 800 generations. Now, if we look at some of the other tests, for example, the 25 marker test, we can get a little bit closer, 6 to 32 generations. 37 marker test, 3 to 15 generations. 67 marker test gets us between 2 and 10. And if you go all the way to the 111 marker test, you can get between 1 and 6 generations back in time. If we look at the mitochondrial hypervariable region 1, we can get 21 to 110 generations back add the hypervariable region 2, and we can almost cut that in half, better than half, 11 to 50 generations. But if you do the entire test, the complete coding region, all 16,569 markers, you're only going to get 7 to 36 generations back. It's, it's not great because the complete mitochondrial DNA has a even lower mutation rate than the hypervariable regions, making it difficult to get any closer to a common ancestor. But a match is a match. Find a match and then rely on traditional genealogy to get yourself closer. So how can TMRCA help me? Recently, they announced the haplogroup information for Otzi the Iceman. Uh, he was announced that he was a G2A2B with an L91 SNP mutation. Now, I'm a G2A3B, so this was pretty exciting because that kind of makes Otzi and I first cousins X number of times removed on the the haplogro haplogroup G family tree. I'm going to use Dean McGee's Y-DNA comparison. It's an excellent tool for comparing two or more Y-DNA records. So now I grabbed a couple of records. I grabbed my own Y-DNA test, and I, I picked a, a good example of G2A2B 
with the L91 SNP. And I'm using Dean McGee's Y-DNA comparison utility. Great utility. It allows you to put in the haplotype for the records. I usually just look at it for the TMRCA information. In this case, I know that, you know, Otzi was found about 5,300 years ago and that our connection has got to be further back. So I'm going to make sure that I push the probability all the way out. So, and I'm going to be using McDonald's uh, mutation rates. They match the marker set much better. And I've already pasted in some Otzi like haplotype information and my own. Hit execute, and we get the results here. So the first thing it's going to give me is the comparison of the two haplotypes, and the color coding will tell me how far off each marker is. But the, the interesting thing is it gives me a number of years back, and there is a, uh, based on this calculation, a connection, a potential connection of about going back about 7,200 years. I've already done some previous work on haplogroup G migration, and I have determined that uh, as far as the haplogroup, the subgroup G2A, they pretty much followed this type of a migration path out of the G origin area of the Caucasus Mountains. Um, they more than likely traveled up the, the Danube River to just north of the Alps. At that point, the, the G group split, some going south and some going north. Uh, so Otzi was found here on the Italian-Austrian border. Um, if we go back a couple of thousand years before that, our common ancestor probably lived somewhere along the Danube. Next, I'm going to look at uh, Alexander Hamilton one of them, uh, America's Founding Fathers. Uh, and I'm going to use Y-Search to select a group of uh, Alexander Hamilton-related records. So I used Alexander Hamilton's haplotype. I plugged it into Y-Search, and I was able to get a selection of similar Y-DNA uh, from their database. Uh, it comes up with a, a number of various last names, including other Hamiltons, some Hogan, some Normans, um, Coopers, etc. Now, the nice thing is I can take this information and I can cut and paste it into Dean McGee's Y-DNA comparison tool. So I'm, I've already pasted in the the Y search data into the comparison tool, and I'm going to hit an extra check here, which is to generate fill-up data, and we'll get into that in just a moment. So I'm going to hit execute, and the results give me a comparison of the haplotypes. and the marker distance. You can see anything that is a green zero, it's essentially identical uh, haplotypes, all the way up to one difference, five differences, seven differences. And then the tool calculates how many years back based on uh, 30 years per generation. It's a lot of information. I mean, one of the very first things I'm going to do is I might take the uh, Hamilton record and, and read across and see where the, the the close matches are. You can see potentially a, a you know 90 year, 90 year, 90 year, and those are just other Hamiltons that probably had an exact match, and they're they're good within uh, three generations. I've got another Hamilton here that is 240 years. So it's going back a little bit further. There wasn't an exact match. 
But it's, it's a lot of data that we're looking at here. So what I like to do to clear, clean up and understand the data a little bit and get into a, a better understanding and visualize it is I clicked on that Philip data, and that generates a table here at the bottom that then I can cut and paste into another tool, which will actually generate a visual look at this data. It'll create a phylogenetic tree. So using Philip tools, I can create a phylogenetic tree. And the nice thing is it will take that bunch of numbers on the screen and then group closely related records together. So I've put in the, the Philip data into a tree viewer. And this is just a, a quick view of how the data kind of lumps did together. You can see over on this edge, you've got all the Hamiltons grouping together. You've got the Hogan's grouping over here. You've got the Coopers over here. And you've got the Normans grouping over here. Let's take a look at it in a slightly different view. So in this typical phylogenetic tree view, you can also see that, again, the, the, the surnames are grouping. So here's the Hamiltons grouping together. Here's that one Hamilton that was uh, a little bit more removed. This is about a 90-year a, a or three-generation line. This was uh, 240 years. Um, but now you can see kind of a grouping. You can see that the Hogan's, which is an Irish name, is grouping together with the Hamilton's. And then very closely together is these Coopers, who are also more than likely a, a, a Scottish name. They're all grouping together. And then a next group out are these Normans. And then we've got this, this, this Bryn that falls way outside. It's an outlier. It just doesn't quite fit with with all the records. But this is a great way to, to visualize and, and, and group the data. Now that I've grouped the, the, the data records together and I've got these names, I'm going to just kind of analyze it myself. I'm going to look at the, the surnames for clues. I mean, Cooper is an occupational name. It doesn't really tell me much. I do know that it is probably... It, it, it's definitely an English type, English or Scottish name. I see a lot of Coopers in Scotland. Um, Hogan, Irish, uh, may be derived from the Gaelic word for young. Still doesn't quite help me with the analysis I'm doing. Now, the Norman name is a location-based name, and it might actually indicate uh, descent from Normandy. Now, if we look at uh, the surname Hamilton, if we break Hamilton into Hamel and town, which is probably where Hamilton came from, we see that Hamill is actually a surname from Normandy also. Now, Alexander Hamilton is haplogroup I1, and all these folks are I1, which is Scandinavian, or in this case, I would call it Viking DNA. The connection to the surname Norman and the Norman origins of Hamilton, along with the DNA, make a strong argument for this group's origin as Normandy-based Viking descendants. So these folks either came over as part of the Norman invasion or were granted land afterwards. So for me, the greatest benefits of the TMRCA calculations is it takes you beyond your paper genealogy. At some point, paper runs out and you have to then take DNA and take it further. It really allows you to take a group of DNA records and analyze the connectivity. Once you know the, the when of your records, it starts to help make connections to historic events like the Norman invasion of England. And when you combine the when with the where, it gives you the ability to map your tribe. I'm Mike Malio saying, where did you come from? Thank you.